So I am Dana Backman. I'm trained as an astronomer, but for the last, um, uh, actually it's surprising, 17 years, I've been doing uh, education and public outreach for the SOFIA uh, mission uh, uh, based at the SETI Institute. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I have a desk at NASA Ames, but my uh, I'm an a, a employee of the SETI Institute in Mountain View. And um, and for the last four years, my main responsibility has been running the Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors uh, uh, High School Teachers on the Plane um, uh, program. And so uh, got a lot of experience with Sophia and happy to accept your invitation to, uh, to uh, give a talk um, here. Uh, so uh, so um, yeah, the org chart's a little complicated. I, I work for the SETI Institute, but I sit at NASA Ames, and um, we're funded from NASA headquarters, but you don't need to know how the sausage is made. This is a picture of Sophia in flight. Um, I wonder if um, if somebody wants to, if you want to ask a question, I'm delighted to, to uh, uh, pause and answer a question. So go ahead and unmute. Uh, uh, um, this is more like a conversation. It's not that big of a group. And if you ask questions, it gets lets me steer. So I don't mind questions while, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to save them to the end if you don't want to. Uh, so here is Sophia in a, during a test flight, one of the first early open door test flights. It's a 747 SP that uh, uh, sh a short body 747 meant for long duration flights. They only made 40 of them and there aren't very many still flying, but this was purchased by NASA as used from United Airlines back in 1996. And then they chopped it to put in the, the 106, well, 2.7 meter telescope here behind a rollback door and you see on the tail is NASA logo but that's also DLR that's the German Space Agency's logo so it's a 20% uh, German 80% US project the Germans bought the high performance engines they built the telescope uh, we supplied the airplane and made, made the mods to to carry it uh, and the plane in fact at this moment is Sitting at Cologne Airport for a six-week flight series out of uh, out of German uh, in European airspace. So, um, but why would somebody do something like cut a hole in the in the side of a plane and put a 17-ton telescope in it? Um, uh, I, uh, you may have heard about Sophia along the way, but I'll 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 pretend that you haven't. Um, uh, in fact, I gave a similar talk. 12 years ago to your club, I think, something like that, um, uh, maybe. Anyway, uh, so a little bit about infrared astronomy, a little bit about Sophia's operation, a little bit about Sophia's science highlights. Um, you folks are a, a, a amateur astronomers club, and, and I know from experience that you guys uh, know a lot of astronomy, so I don't have to pitch this at a at a low level. In fact, when I was a postdoc at Kitt Peak Observatory, when they had the uh, busloads of, of people come up for a public night, and if it was a bus full of amateur astronomers, we were all terrified because they would ask us questions like, so what's the magnitude of the central star in this planetary nebula? And I, I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> so anyway, so... Uh, so an infrared observatory in particular, uh, because of the wavelengths that it, 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 it collects, uh, you can study objects that are cooler than normal stars uh, and examples are planets in the solar system, but also stars and planets forming. Um, stars inside or behind interstellar dust because interstellar dust is uh, 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 much more transparent at infrared wavelengths than it is at optical wavelengths and also the uh, large organic molecules and uh, and biogenic molecules that includes water that's a fancy word um, uh, a lot of their spectral fingerprints are in the far infrared and so those are some of the sweet spots for Sophia's uh, science um, how is an infrared telescope different from an, an optical telescope um, you have to contend with the fact that Basically, the 
the telescope is on fire, the astronomer is on fire, um, the, uh, they're all light sources in the infrared. And so um, uh, what, one of the strategies is it doesn't have a light baffle and a, a, a big research optical telescope would have all sorts of baffling to keep stray light out, but the baffling is usually black tubes and black pieces of metal, which are screaming infrared sources. So an infrared telescope does not have the, the light baffles that an optical telescope of the same size would have. And also the secondary is undersized, so it does not look at the entire primary. So, uh, th so that you're not getting light from the rim of the primary, infrared light from the, from the rim of the primary into your beam. So, so the, tele, the, the primary mirror is 2.7 meters, but the secondary is designed to look at only the central 2.5 meters of the, of the primary mirror. So that we have a, we have an, a, a never ending debate about whether we should bill ourselves as a 2.5 meter telescope or a 2.7 meter telescope for, for diffraction purposes. It's a 2.7 meter telescope because that's the aperture diameter, but for light gathering purposes, you're not looking at the whole primary. So it's two point, It's a 2.5 meter telescope in terms of light gathering power, and it's a 2.7 meter telescope in terms of diffraction. So uh, uh, just that, that, that's trivia that I would not offer to any audience except this one. <laughs> anyway, okay. And, but Sophia being a mobile observatory, there's things that it can do that ha don't have anything particular to do with infrared, but we can go watch, for instance, stellar occultations where the shadow of the solar system object falls on some remote part of the earth where there is no uh, other observing facility. Uh, and uh, the rings of Uranus were discovered by the Sophia's predecessor, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, uh, flying in the middle of the Indian Ocean where pretty clearly there's no other facility that could watch the, uh, uh, the Uranus system cross in front of a, of a background star. And the, the rings were discovered that way. So, uh, um, and so Sophia does deployments to, to watch occultations uh, fairly often. Anyway, what you're seeing here is Orion at optical wavelengths. And what's basically prominent in this picture are things about the temperature of the sun, a few thousand to a few 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And in the right, this is a far infrared, it's actually at a wavelength of 60 microns image of Orion, uh, actual, uh, to, to be precise, this is, these are IRAS data and it was scanned. It didn't, they didn't have array detectors when uh, the IRAS satellite operated in 1983. So it was a sort of a non-filled array of single detectors that was scanned across here. So the, 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 the picture was constructed, but it, it, effectively this is a 60 micron wavelength image, 60,000 nanometers. Uh, and, um, and in this picture, the stuff that's prominent is stuff that's at 50 Kelvin or 100 Kelvin. And in particular, the big star forming clouds, M42 and over here in Montes Herodes and uh, so on. And the interstellar gas, which is uh, dust. It's a, the dust is doing most of the infrared radiating at, at tens of Kelvin. Here, so the universe is totally different. Uh, uh, no surprise uh, at in the infrared uh, than it is at, at visible wavelengths. The only thing in common between the two pictures, I can just see Betelgeuse here, and that's not Betelgeuse's photosphere. That's the, uh, the cool cloud of 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 uh, outflow from Betelgeuse that's showing up as the infrared source. The star itself is not doing anything at 60 microns. So, um, so now here's a, a, a chart of atmospheric opacity versus wavelength. So, um, and to, it's, it's, it might be counterintuitive, but the atmosphere is a good blocker, good thing. It's a good blocker of gamma rays, X-rays, and most ultraviolet because those kinds of photons, as they plow through the atmosphere, they ionize the atoms and lose all their energy, so they don't get anywhere. Uh, visible light gets to the ground. Some infrared gets to the ground, but some does not, is blocked by water vapor primarily. 
and then uh, radio uh, uh, wavelengths get to the ground. So, so the infrared is a sort of a half and half zone here. Some of it's uh, observable from high mountaintops, uh, some of it is not. And we have Sophia then as a compromise between the space platform and a mountaintop platform. Um, so as is Mauna Kea, that's where I actually did my uh, uh, PhD observations, uh, mostly at the, the University of Hawaii 88 inch over here and the IRTF, the NASA three meter telescope here, that's where most of my data came from. And this is an old picture, uh, but it has the Keck telescopes and um, this is Gemini and this is the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. Um, but Spitzer Space Telescope um, is far above the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, it was in solar orbit. That's an 85 centimeter cryogenically cooled mirror uh, that was uh, uh, launched into, as I said, solar orbit uh, and operated for more than five years uh, 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 above the Earth's atmosphere and outside of the Earth environment, in fact. So Sophia is meant to be a a space telescope that comes home every morning um, or uh, yeah, an in inexpensive space telescope that comes home every morning and its visual acu its acuity, I think that might be the word, it's, it receives 80% of the far infrared radiation that reaches the top of the atmosphere. So in some sense, it's 80% as capable as a space telescope, but it's only operating at uh, uh, 40,000 to 45,000 feet. This is the the boundary between the troposphere, which is full of water vapor, and then the tropopause, and then the stratosphere is quite dry. So if you can get your um, telescope up into the stratosphere, your infrared telescope, you're, you've got most of the mileage of, uh, that you would get from putting mileage in terms of, of de detection of infrared of making it a, spa a satellite based uh, telescope because at the altitude that uh, which Sophia flies is about uh, still 20% of the Earth's atmosphere uh, is above that altitude, but the uh, it's uh, far less than 1% of the water vapor uh, above, uh, uh, above Sophia's uh, altitude operating in the lower stratosphere. So we're, we're not that high, we're only 10% higher than commercial flights, but that has some advantages. We're not mixing it up, uh, except during a descent, you know, takeoff and, and, and uh, landing, we're not mixing it up with commercial traffic um, where uh, we, we, we can file any kind of crazy flight plan, you'll see in a minute. And, uh, and we're not, you know, tangling with the, the uh, Lufthansa overnight from Frankfurt into LA or something like that, okay. So again, here's Sophia. So I went with 2.5 meters on this slide. Uh, the aircraft is based at NASA Armstrong, uh, a facility outside the Armstrong fence, actually. It's in Palmdale at Palmdale Regional Airport, which is also an Air Force Plant 42 facility. Uh, so that part of the reason that it's not actually inside the Armstrong slash Edwards Air Force Base uh, property is that uh, it's much easier for our German collaborators to get into this somewhat lower security facility than having them be at, uh, at Edwards AFB. So anyway, so this is in Palmdale, which is about 20 miles from Edwards. So if I could ask, so it's not actually on the Dryden, uh, NASA Dryden facility. Correct. Correct. Uh, Dryden's been renamed Armstrong, but but it was Dryden for a, many, a long time. And so it's like 20 miles from Dryden in, in, in the middle of uh, or on the outskirts of the town of Palmdale. I see. OK. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't aware it had been renamed, although it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. And uh, it's a good name they picked. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, OK. Well, Hugh Dryden uh, probably deserved a little memorial, too. <laughs> uh, I think some of the facilities at Armstrong are still named Dryden th this and that, I think. They didn't completely, uh, you know, efface his name from everything, right? The park bench outside or something. Well, it's a little better than that, maybe, yeah. 
So, okay. So, um, it's a, so as, as I said, it's a 20% share with the Germans, the 20% of the budget, 20% of the observing time, uh, tw- uh, uh, you know, some of the instruments and so on. Um, the first science flight was, was a while ago now, 10 years ago, um, and still just reaching the goal of 128 hour science flights per year or eight hours of observing as a 10 hour flight in which you're actually on the sky for eight hours. That's a normal thing and hoped for a 20 year lifetime. Um, uh, And then it goes to the Southern hemisphere usually uses or so to this point, we've used the, um, the Christchurch, uh, a New Zealand facility that's used in the Southern Hemisphere summer for uh, uh, staging stuff to go to the Antarctic, the NSF or Antarctic bases. But in the winter, Southern Hemisphere winter, when we're down there, then no, no then the NSF has cleared out, and Sophia and the uh, people use the NSF offices and the NSF tarmac uh, for at Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, and uh, we're going back again this summer. Did, last summer didn't happen because New Zealand wasn't letting anybody in from outside. So um, so this um, 747SP, and, and we don't usually don't open the door until we're at 39,000 feet. Um, uh, this is 17 ton, two points here. I went with 2.7 meters for the size of the telescope and uh, a set of science instruments, uh, cameras, spectrographs, polarimeters that we can put at, at the telescope focus, which is inside the cabin where they can be reached. But the instruments are, you know, uh, 500 to 1,000 pound uh, cryogenic um, uh, tanks, and so we don't swap them during a flight. They're they're usually on one instrument will be on for a two or three week flight series. Then you pull it off. It takes a day to pull one off and put the next one on, and then it's the next one's on for two or three weeks. Here's a cross section of Sophia. So there's a a uh, bulkhead here, and we're operating in a shirt sleeve environment on board. Uh, there's the telescope. Uh, um, um, uh, it's the, this is the, at the time this was purchased, this was the widest body aircraft that we could get. So, so 2.5 meter telescope, 2.7 meter telescope is basically constrained by the diameter of the fuselage. Um, there are, so the tele, the instrument, what, uh, whatever's doing the actual data collection is mounted here. It's a Nesmith focus. So the, the light goes through the bulkhead down this tube and then the uh the actual the instrument is actually a pressure seal on this tube and uh then we're operating like i said shirt sleeve environments the telescope operators the science team the mission director and the flight planner who are um you know sort of coordinating everything between this deck and the and the cockpit and then uh the educators that i bring on the plane, we have our own dedicated console here. Um, And uh, so the flight, the mission director uh, communicate is the point of contact to the cockpit. So you don't have all all dozen to 20 people sitting down here trying to talk to the cockpit crew. You just have one person, of course, talking talking upstairs. Um, Okay, so see if I can show you a video wish me luck um so i should stop uh stop sharing screen start the video and then share screen again i think uh oh Oh, okay, I'm doing the wrong thing here. I think, can you see the plane? Yes. All right. Okay, uh, this is already going better than my (laughs) my usual. So this is from a chase plane uh, following Sophia at dusk. We don't open the door until the sun's down and we close it before the sun comes up. 
there are alternate landing sites uh, to, to go to in case there's the door sticks open and you're wor worried about the sun coming up because you do not want the sun up while you're doing this. So uh, here is the, the door being opened from the chase plane uh, flying alongside Sophia at, uh, alt at altitude. And uh, that's kind of really cool. What you would be surprised, uh, um, we can't tell. We have a readout that says the door is opened, but there's no no sign that this is happening. In fact, the pilot, the first time the door was opened in a test flight, the pilot said the plane rolled a couple degrees to the left, then straightened out, and then it handled just like a regular 747 without a hole in it, which is, that was the desired state, you have to imagine. Okay, so stop share, go back to my slides. Dr. Brakeman, we've, yes. we've got a question that came in on chat. Um, sure. It says, uh, does the plane support airborne refueling? Um, no, uh, it doesn't. Uh, that, you know, we could we could work for 36 or 48 hours, but no, we it does not have a, a, a facility for for airborne uh, refueling. Uh, what one of the things that you know it would would be nice, but we can't. Okay, the, sharing. The, there was a quick follow. There was a follow up on that too about uh, what about the ambient heat from the plane itself? Does that affect the uh, infrared camera? Uh, 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 that would be you would be surprised. It's a it's a, a good intuitive question. There is the plane right behind where there is the 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 telescope right behind two jet engines, but they're below the the plume from the jet engines is below the the shelf the 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 bottom of the door opening. And we have we do not detect the we do not detect infrared radiation from the engine plumes, uh, and and that's a good thing. So do, are you seeing my slide again? Yep. Okay. Pointing the telescope. So the the telescope is floating on a spherical bearing with an oil layer in between, and that is embedded in the bulkhead. So that's I'm indicating that with my cursor. This is spherical bearing, and the light pipe passes the Nesmith uh, tube goes through the, the bearing. Um, the telescope has those gyroscopes attached to the telescope to sense its orientation. Uh, and then there's optical TV guider cameras. There's two, uh, a, a, a wide field and a medium field camera on the front ring of the telescope. And there is uh, a, a third uh, high, high magnification uh, uh, optical guider camera that's actually underneath the tube in the camera i mean in the cabin underneath the infrared instrument so see if i can ah uh, hmm uh this is another way to look at this uh of the the fact that that sophia is able to do things that a ground-based observatory can't this is here is the footprint in wavelength and resolving power of the different instruments of Sophia, but I, a more I'm going to spend more time on this. So uh, at Mauna Kea wave uh, altitude, which is uh, just under 14,000 feet, the, um, the atmosphere transmission is interrupted by these uh, strong absorption, uh, uh, spectral absorption lines of the Earth's atmosphere. And from about 30 microns wavelength to 300 microns wavelength, it's opaque. The Earth's atmosphere is opaque even at Mauna Kea altitude. Whereas Sophia um, uh, at, at, at uh, 12 to 14 kilometers altitude then, um, you see, do see that that the far infrared is chopped up by water vapor lines. Most of the, these are spectral lines of water vapor, but um, uh, it's sort of average of 80% transmission all across this range, which you can't do even from Mauna Kea. This is a uh, carbon dioxide line, which you don't get above by being at Sophia's, uh, Sophia's altitude. Uh, here are the instruments the current set of instruments it, uh, built e each of them at, built at a different uh, uh, university or uh, research facility. So forecast is built by Cornell FPI plus by the university of Stuttgart XC's by the university of Texas. 
uh, Hawk by University of Chicago and then finished at JPL. Fifi LS was also built at the University of Stuttgart and Great was built at um, uh, the Max Planck Institute. So uh, you see good representation of German instruments. So again, these instruments, um, they stay on for two or three weeks and then you take a day to swap one off and put another one in that then is on for another two or three week flight series. Uh, and so the astronomers, uh, I'll go back to this one. So depending on what space, uh, uh, spectral resolution and what wavelength range your uh, object of interest is doing its stuff at, then the astronomer when making an observing proposal will pick one of the instruments uh, based on that. So this is what it looks like on board. And I cannot get past the illusion when I'm on Sophia that this view is facing forward. Everybody's facing in the same direction. This is facing aft. This is the back <laughs> of the plane. This is the bulkhead behind which the telescope is situated. And that's the forecast uh, mid-infrared camera, the red cryostat with the gold um, control boxes on it. And uh, so I took this picture myself uh, standing up over the teacher console looking towards the back. And these are the, uh, the uh, let's see, this is the mission director and the flight planner. Here's the science team up here. Uh, and here are the telescope operators here. And this is a normal, this is a normal scene on board the, a flight at night. Uh, people are talking on the intercom, we're wearing uh, headsets because it's pretty noisy. Um, and uh, and it's a quite a ballet, uh, a very impressive. Uh, uh, one of the things that the teachers that I bring on board notice is how everybody does. The, everybody fits together. Everybody does their job. And if there's a problem, people don't freak out. They're very. They're the the communication is very precise. It's very impressive watching them problem solve. Um, you know. You know, here you are burning, you know, thousands of gallons of fuel a minute um, and uh, so on and so forth. They, they solve problems very well. It's a very experienced and impressive crew on board. <coughs> here, excuse me, here are two flight plans, which are typical. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but here's the West Coast. This is Baja. Here's Mexico, Idaho, Oregon. Um, and we're leaving from Palmdale, flying out through this little keyhole, which is between military. So the, the, the weird polygons here are uh, military no-fly zones, most of them. Some of, not all of them are active at any one time, but we need to avoid those usually. And so leaving LA, heading out over the ocean, there's sort of a keyhole here that all the commercial traffic and Sophia have to go out through. And then each zig zag in the zigzag is a different object being observed because you turn the plane to point the telescope to zeroth order and then fine tune it from there. But if you're gonna look at the once a star that's down here, you fly the plane this way. And if you're gonna look at a star that's up here to the north, you fly the plane to the east and so on. So zigzag, zigzag is half a dozen objects in the course of the night would be a normal six or 10. Uh, flight targets. And this is a flight that went <coughs> over the mainland uh, instead, all got all the way back to Minnesota before turning around to come back home to Palmdale. I've been on flights that went to, uh, to, to the Yukon um, and we saw a beautiful aurora up there. Um, so, so the flight plan is determined only by what objects are being observed that night. And there's a massive piece of software that puts the puzzle together of which objects need to be observed for how long to get the astronomers the data they requested. And then after, after looking at six to 10 such objects, you're back home again in Palmdale at dawn. So um, I'll pause for a second, questions. There's one in the chat, right, from uh, yeah. Bill? If you could, okay. Uh, I think we... those have been answered. Um, I, I filled in for Daryl and, and the, the last one I think was answered with that uh, when he talked about the, the, the guiding cameras on the uh, telescope.
Yeah. Do you ever encounter excursions, turbulent excursions that are beyond the alignment capability of the telescope? Oh yeah. <laughs> and any any turbulent situation that would make uh, the that makes the pilot tell us to buckle in, then they buckle in the telescope too, and we stop we stop observing. And that uh, it's happened, you know, a good number of times on flights I've been on. Uh, so yeah, so so noticeable turbulence, and you stop. Because uh, the telescope, you don't want the telescope shaking around, um, right? But yes, um, and then uh, the flight, the flight planners, the meteorologist helps plan a flight plan that goes around really nasty weather, and but still gets the scientific targets. So you know that they do their best. Um, so actually, here then, so I have a series of Sophia science results uh, in uh, the next uh, half a dozen, maybe 10 slides. This is, and I, I'm looking at the clock, I realize, um, you know, I've, uh, uh, I've got maybe 20 minutes to go. Um, this is the very first image from the, from the first light flight back in May uh, 2010. Um, this was uh, with the forecast, the Cornell uh, mid infrared camera. This is a combination of 5.4, 24, and 37 micron images of Jupiter. This is an optical light image taken uh, about, of about the same rotational phase of Jupiter and, uh, and within a, a you know, a, a close in time to the Sophia image. And what you see is that the heat escaping from inside Jupiter, because it's been well known for decades that Jupiter gives off more heat than it receives from the sun. But this image shows that it's not coming out uniformly. There's a huge uh, amount of heat coming out in this band here, which is an upwelling. So in the optical, you see the upwelling, the brownish red color of, of organic compounds. And in the infrared, you see that there's heat coming from the interior of the planet. So both of these two images together have huge amount more information than either of them by themselves. But what anyway? Here's here's the heat from Jupiter's interior leaking out and uh, at, at an upwelling where organics are reaching the surface or you know top of the clouds. Um, now here's an interesting and uh, very uh, you know timely. Uh, back in uh, more than 10 years ago, Mike Mumma at NASA Goddard, uh, using a ground-based uh, 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 telescope, uh, ground-based instrument on one of the Keck telescopes, detected uh, significant methane, detectable amounts of methane, not boatloads, but but you know he had a he had a good signal of noise methane in the Mars spectrum, and then Curiosity detects occasional puffs of, of methane bearing air blowing past it in its Gale Crater uh, location. So not all the time, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, but occasionally there's, a, a, there's a, a, a gust of wind that's carrying methane. Very interesting because there aren't very many inorganic ways to make methane. There are some, but they, uh, but they uh, correspond usually to volcanic processes, and the detection from Earth of the of the uh, methane was not at the volcanic provinces on the surface of Mars. It's also seasonal in that the, there's more methane detected in uh, local summer than there is in local. Uh, winter almost reminds me of the old one I was growing up, the Golden Wonder Book of Mars before Mariner got there. Um, uh, you know, uh, that uh, looks like there's a wave of green coming down from the North Pole as the as the summer advances. And maybe, you know, they are the Martians are irrigating the pineapples or whatever. Well, so um, there's a seasonal effect here. And now interest. So curiosity detects methane episodically from the earth by working really hard with the big telescope you can see methane and that's not correlated with volcanic provinces and then the ESA Russian uh, 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 orbiter probe detects basically zero uh, 
uh, methane. So isn't that interesting? We don't know. Uh, oh, let's see. I want to go here. So here are observations with the University of Texas. Uh, actually, now uh, the, the team has moved to UC Davis. But anyway, uh, U Texas, UC Davis team, which built the XCs in a uh, mid infrared spectrometer. And this is this would be where the spectrometer slit. This is how be how it would look uh, projected on the planet. You're getting all of this terrain all, all at once, but you can you know you can move the slit and down. Oops, here and um, here are here's one of their publications in 2018. This is these are model curves uh, of how much of a spectral line you would see if there was one part per billion or two parts per billion or three or four or five. And it's about the 1.1 part per billion uh, contour of the model kind of goes through the data, although, you know, lots of uh, very low signal to noise here. So this was claimed by this uh, research group to be using this instrument exes on Sophia, uh, a confirmation that there was detectable um, methane and Mars. So it's it, right now it's the controversy because you have some facilities and instruments that don't see it and some that see it occasionally. Uh, so the jury's still out. But if there is methane detected on Mars, it's really interesting, uh, uh, hard to make non-biologically. Now, this is a complete changing subject here. This is a light curve from a Pluto occultation, a Pluto uh, in 2015, went in front of a, uh, a 14th magnitude star, and the um, the the occultation shadow track went near New Zealand when Sophia was already in New Zealand for a, a northern hemisphere summer, southern hemisphere winter time. So they went out. They 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 uh, watched the occultation from out over the Pacific. So this is a few minutes of, of, of uh, ingress of the shadow. And then there's a central flash when the star is directly, perfectly aligned behind Pluto. So you have to get Sophia to the right spot to within 60 kilometers to have this, see this central flash, which is the entire atmosphere of Pluto being lit up as a ring by the star in the back. So alignment is, uh, you don't get this unless you're perfectly aligned, but there's a lot of information about the structure and density of Pluto's atmosphere from the, the precise shape of the central flash. And then the, the egress and the, and the star moves, uh, the planet moves out or the object moves out from in front of the star. So I was on a flight, not this one, but a flight in 2012 when there was a Pluto occultation and the alignment was good and the central flash was very weak. And in 2015, it was very obvious, very strong central flash, which meant that the atmosphere of Pluto was denser in 2015 than 2012, which is uh, counter to anyone's expectations because the planet's moving away from the sun. And so the atmosphere should be collapsing and freezing out. So, so we had these data and this was three weeks before New Horizons reached Pluto. So we told the New Horizons guys, you know, it looks like Pluto's geologically active because the atmosphere is denser in 2015 than it was in 2012. And lo and behold, of course, the New Horizons people found, found all sorts of um, evidence of, of geological activity, um, um, uh, uh, cryogenic lava flows, uh, partially buried craters and mountains, and so on and so forth. So it's understood now that from the uh, abundant evidence from New Horizons that uh, Pluto is geologically active or has been recently, but we can say from Sophia that we get we had a clue three weeks before the New Horizons encounter. So now I'm moving on a long ways away to the center of the galaxy. This is probably one of my favorite Sophia uh, images or results of all time, pointing directly at the center of the galaxy, Sad J star, the the, the uh, supermassive black hole is in the center of this massive star cluster uh, right here. 
And with the HST near infrared camera, you can see through most of the dust clouds and, and you can see the stars cluster, the star cluster that's right at the center of the galaxy. This is an image with the forecast camera of material that's at 100 or 150 to 200 Kelvin. So again, the stars aren't showing up in this image because they're too hot. Uh, and this material is not showing up in this image because it's too cold. It's like two different universes. But this is a torus of, of molecular clouds orbiting the central black hole and the scale bar. This is one parsec or a little bit more than three light years. So that's sort of the radius of this torus. So this is not the accretion disk. The accretion disk is, would be you know, smaller than the solar system and, and be an invisibly tiny point in here. But this white sort of bird-like or, or uh, uh, trying, uh, you know, a two-legged thing. This is material peeling off of the torus and pouring down into the black hole, uh, you know, down to the center. And, and this is um, really interesting and uh, tells, uh, tells us, gives us some perspective on other galaxies farther away where we can't resolve the central uh, region around the supermassive black hole. Okay. Um, yes, question. If you go back to that slide, do you yes. sort of see that same image though here? Like I'm, I, I'm like, there's like a, a kind of a bright spot at the, on, the Hubble, on the Hubble image, a bright spot at the top there. And then, you know, maybe faintly, you can sort of imagine that there's this bird like figure there in that stark in that middle of that star cluster? Can Maybe. you, uh, no, that's unrelated, but what you can see are the denser parts of the torus showing up as blockages in your view in the visible image, see, uh, right? So these, these darker spots in the okay. visible image are higher opacity uh, dust in the near infrared and they correspond to dense parts of the, so you can, you can trace the torus uh, more okay. or less by the darker spots in here, but the, this, these are the same scale, these two images. I see, okay, yeah. thank you. All right, okay, you're welcome. Okay, so now here was a, a sort of a headline, um, uh, uh, I think a year ago, um, Sophia observing with the far infrared spectrometer GREAT, which is built by the, at the Max Planck Institute, um, observing the planetary nebula NGC 7027 and detected helium hydride, which, um, uh, you know, my chemistry class in high school was probably the worst uh, chemistry class ever in the history of the universe, but at least they drummed into my head, you know, uh, uh, no, noble gases don't make compounds, but actually if you push them hard enough, you can, you can get that to happen. So helium, uh, helium plus a proton is a stable configuration, uh, at least um, metastable. And um, the calculations are that after the Big Bang, um, this would have been the first stable molecule um, before the molecular hydrogen. The, 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 the ionization and temperature and density would have led this to this being formed first, and then molecular hydrogen would have been later. So first, first uh, this, these molecules detected in NGC 7027 are not primordial. They would have been made you know, recently in the planetary nebula, but this is, the, this is the molecule that would have been the first one in the history of the universe. And here's the data, here are the data. <laughs> and the, the gray uh, is the helium hydride and the red is a carbon monoxide line uh, reduced by a factor of 25 from its, so only the high resolution of SOFIA lets the helium uh, spectral lines be, be separated from the much stronger uh, carbon monoxide lines. Uh, this, this spectrometer has a spectral resolution of 100 million, so it can do uh, Doppler shifts of three meters per second, which is like uh, ferociously uh, amazing. Okay, uh, now let's see. If you have here completely changing subject, uh, interstellar grains, interstellar dust grains are not spheres. They, they, uh, we have evidence that they're like little needles or little uh, footballs and they align in a magnetic field and then their infrared emission is polarized. So the, the magnetic field in the, in the interstellar medium 
tends to align the grains and the aligned grains make polarized infrared radiation. So if you take a polarized polar polarimeter images of interstellar clouds, you can, you can back out, you can derive what the orientation and strength of the magnetic field is. So there's a whole, whole completely different way of looking at things. This is a, this is a, uh, an yeah, ESO telescope picture uh, of the Orion Nebula at the near infrared. So you can see the protostars. Most of the white uh, 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 stellar objects here are actually protostars embedded in M42. This is the Becklin Neugebauer object, which is the first protostar discovered. It's about uh, 500 Kelvin, something like that. This is my thesis advisor and his thesis advisor named after them. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, or maybe the giants are standing on my shoulders. I'm not quite sure what the, how that works. But what you see here are the calculated magnetic field lines uh, from, uh, from a, a Sophia Hawk plus observation showing, uh, and, and magnetic fields constrain the motion of ionized material. So in some cases, the magnetic fields are, are understood to slow down star formation. And in other cases, they enhance it. And that's what this investigation is trying to find out, whether you could, you know, which way is the game going with the magnetic fields in Orion? Is it, is it net helping or is it net hindering the efficiency of star formation in the cloud there? Um, this is a, a galaxy NGC 1068, and the magnetic fields uh, from the Hawk data appear to go uh, parallel to along the spine of the, the um, uh, spiral arms. Okay, so now the moon, and I, I'm looking at the clock. I'm almost out of time. I hope five more minutes would be okay. Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, this is... I took this picture with my cell phone camera off of the teacher console uh, where we get to see the same display read only that the telescope operators have. So here's the moon and the sort of the Southern uh, stretches of the moon near, uh, I think that's Tico uh, Clavius down here. Here's what the, the um, astronomers were seeing on their uh, data uh, output, but uh, this was an, uh, an attempt to look at the uh, part of the moon away from the southern pole, where we already know from the Elcross uh, impactor that there is um, water, water frozen in the bottoms of shadowed craters. This was an observation far, uh, pretty far away from the pole, hundreds of kilometers away from the pole of the soil. Uh, to distinguish because it had already been from ground-based observations is already clear that there was OH, but whether that was OH or whether that was H2O needed observations at, uh, at, at wavelength that only Sophia can access at, at a wavelength of six microns is the water vapor or not wa molecular water uh, spectral line that is not accessible from the ground. So the, the SOFIA observation was meant to distinguish H2O from OH, and it did. And there was a, a fairly strong detection of water molecules in the soil. So uh, if you see, here's the spectral line of water uh, is the red line at, at, a, at a, a region on the moon near Clavius Crater. And this is a control region a few hundred kilometers away with a, a much a lower signal, no apparent uh, spectral line and the gray. So the gray is the gray is a control spot and the and the red is uh, is a spot uh, where they already knew there was a, an OH signal and then wanted to know if that was OH was part of the water. And so pretty pretty strong. The, the air bars show you how the signal to noise, is you know pretty substantial here. So that was, and uh, uh, it doesn't show in this plot, but the um, the places where the water was detected in the lunar soil. So this is not liquid water. It's it's like uh, water molecules in grains of of soil, you know, 
right? And, and it's, but it's not ice because this is illuminated piece of, of, of turf. It, it's not shadowed. So the sun, you know, this is, this is definitely not ice in the bottom of a crater. Um, the, the places where the detection of water vapor, I'm sorry, water molecules was happening was correlated with other substances. Uh, uh, um, uh, let's see, do I remember? So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, but it's correlated with detection of other things that would be volcanic outgassing. And so this is not probably emplaced by impacts or by the solar wind, this H2O. Uh, it's, it's probably um, uh, outgassed from inside the moon. Uh, that's at least the, the current opinion. So this was a big deal last uh, few months ago. As a, and this may have, may have uh, made written Sophia's ticket because the uh, NASA headquarters people in charge of planning the, you know, the human return to the moon and so on. Um, here's Sophia showing that if, what was the number? If you had a, a cubic meter of lunar soil, there's a, 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 a 10 ounce water bottles worth of water in it. Okay, that's not nothing. Um, that, that, that means, uh, you know, to the folks at NASA headquarters in charge of human exploration that we provided them with the impetus that, that uh, you know, you could, a, a base on the moon that's using local resources is not out of the question anymore. Uh, and now I've just one slide. This is my last slide. Um, there's Sophia uh, having come in uh, before dawn. And this is a group of, of uh, high school teachers that I had escorted on the flight that night. Uh, some of the, one of them is a district uh, um, a science coordinator. But anyway, we had been on board all night uh, watching the astronomers do their stuff. And I take them up to the to the science console and have them ask the scientists, interview the scientists, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And so on. We try to be not obnoxious, but this is the teacher console here. Uh, and then the, the flight uh, planner and mission director here and the telescope operator here. So I, I take groups of four to six teachers. I have two colleagues that I, I take turns with escorting groups of, of uh, high school teachers who we've trained to understand what's going on. And then they take uh, this back to their classrooms. And this is, uh, you can imagine, this is a lot of fun. And that is my last slide. Okay. Well, thank you very okay. much, Dr. Beckman. We You're appreciate welcome. That. Appreciate that. It was an excellent talk. And, uh, oh, good. Lots of food for thought. And uh, I think even those of us who uh, have been aware of Sophia for quite some time, hadn't realized the, uh, the broad scope of its uh, research and, uh, and uh, the, the many uh, areas of, uh, of interest that it's gotten into. The, the only thing it doesn't do is cosmology because it's, the telescope is not sensitive enough. It's not cryogenically cooled. I mean, we're operating at stratospheric temperature of like minus 50 centigrade, <laughs> even minus 70 centigrade. But but the uh, Spitzer uh, infrared instrument that did a lot of cosmological uh, measurements, it's the mirror was at four Kelvin, uh, right? And, and so Sophia doesn't, doesn't have the sensitivity to do cosmology oriented uh, work and we don't, uh, but uh, anything out to nearby galaxies, um, yeah. yeah. Still seems to have uh, plenty of bandwidth to handle a lot of uh, pressing questions and uh, areas of interest. Oh yeah, uh, just uh, one one little side question. Uh, given that it's a seven forty seven SP, uh, was it open bar up on the upper deck? <laughs> <laughs> you, we wish. <laughs> we uh, we're lucky. There's a there's a coffee pot uh, actually. <laughs> right. No, uh, the upstairs, the upper deck, which was a uh, uh, you know a, a first class lounge and so on. It's now. Uh, 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 the people use that to take a nap, cat nap uh, in this there's a half a dozen seats up there and and also there's a test rig that's monitoring the um, um, stress and stress uh, 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 sensors along the plane but uh, other than that no no bar sorry <laughs> okay um, uh, questioning uh, I guess uh, 
I'm not sure who who in our group was attempting to uh, record that. Was Lisa, Michael, were you were you guys uh, recording that or? Uh... No, I'm recording it. Oh, Ed, you're recording it. Okay, so I, so I see. So How do you maintain target alignment? Uh, is uh, so um, so there's there's uh, uh, layers of so the grossest uh, layer is pointing the plane so that the telescope is pointing at the right part of the sky. And you can say that the autopilot is programmed to keep the plane out of the way of the telescope. Uh, right? <laughs> okay, then, then the next layer is that the telescope has gyroscopes and, and a push-pull, pneumatic push-pull uh, devices so to, to point it uh, and the orientation that's calculated to get us at the target. And then you have the three visible guider cameras that are the finest level of the, of the pointing so that you, you know, put a crosshair on your target. And then, and then there's a software uh, feedback loop that just keeps, keeps it in the, keeps it in the box. Um, given the, uh, uh, the heavy uh, German participation, how, how much of the, uh, operating staff or, or uh, the crew, the, the operational crew on a typical flight typically is German. The, uh, a lot of the telescope operators uh, are uh, German. Uh, some of them are, are uh, telescope operators from US ground-based observatories, but the people uh, in, it basically in charge of the telescope's happiness and health are, are German. Okay. Well, they uh, they're based. They're based in Palmdale, but they're German uh, 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 citizens who are uh, detailed to the U.S. for a while. So we'll have, you know, we'll have several Germans on any on any given flight. Usually, people uh, uh, concerned with the telescope. Yeah, as you say, they built the telescope, and yeah, it sounds like more than half the instruments too. Yeah, uh, the, uh, there's there's been a, a generation of instruments that retired and so on, but the of the current crop of instruments, uh, 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 three of the six is that yeah, three of the six are German uh, uh, origin. Yeah, mm -hmm. are all those German instruments space kept on the plane at the same time, or are they swapped in and out? I may have missed. They're them. swapped in and out. They're 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 kept in in labs uh, uh, on the uh, off the hangar floor. And then uh, we cr we bring them up on a scissor jack and in the door, and put them on and pull the other one off and bring it out. So the 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 instruments that are not on the plane are in in labs in the hangar building. Well, when you're currently it's in uh, Cologne, I think you said. So yes, it just take one instrument package or is the whole set. Well, taken we, over we, or how did uh, that work? we just took one. Uh, the great actually uh, we didn't even take that uh, it was the great instrument which was sitting at home at at Max Planck in in Bonn and so they just drove it on a truck over to Cologne so <laughs> in this case right but when we go to, to New Zealand they'll have one instrument on the telescope and another one uh, another one and down below in a in a in a cradle and maybe they'll ship one in a box, which is scary. <laughs> but so, so the, some of the Southern Hemisphere deployments have used three instruments. One, one went down on the plane mounted on the telescope. One was in the cargo hold and one got shipped commercial. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. But, uh, they... How large is the range of wavelengths that it can see? Um, the the instrument Sophia instruments that we have now go from uh, 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 visual uh, uh, so uh, 400 nanometers 0. 0.4 microns all the way out to 250 microns so f visible to far infrared uh, uh, 0. 0.4 microns to 250 microns it's 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 uh, so it's actually an excellent question. There's no other observatory in space or on the ground with as wide a wavelength uh, uh, accessibility as Sophia. We, 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 we've got it. We've got the market on wavelengths cornered. Okay. A question on, uh, you have a program that you bring in like high school teachers, I guess other educators. What's the process for getting uh, educators on board to that program? We, uh, we, f we start with a memo of understanding with districts. So what we do is first we recruit school districts and we try to get big ones 
or uh, ones with a wide demographic range. And then once we've have an MOU um, uh, memo with with the district, then then we have an application process each year, and we have a peer review panel that reviews the applications. In fact, we just did this in January. We picked the 2021 group of 30 teachers, and uh, the press release is coming out. And I hope in a week. So look for a, look for a news release uh, about the 2021 Sophia Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors. But it's it's a peer peer pa peer review panel that reviews applications from districts that are already partners with us. But the, we have 30 districts across the country, and we add them new ones each year. How do you get new districts added if there's a district that's interested? Uh, we, we go to national science uh, uh, teacher meetings and the administrators walk by and say, wow, that's really cool. How do we get on board? And you say, here, sign this. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Just, just a very good talk. It's just fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Thank yeah, you. Thanks welcome. so much for, for uh, providing that for us.